Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Lee Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, we are so glad that you have tuned in to have Bible study with us tonight. We know that you have a multitude of choices when it comes to where you might uh, tune in for Bible study, uh, but we are just so glad that you have decided to join us tonight for our Wednesday night Bible study. We remind ourselves that today is the day the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I want to invite you uh, to journey with us tonight as we continue in our study of the book of Acts, and we'll be looking at Acts number, chapter number 25, verses one through 27. Again, journey with us in the book of Acts, chapter number 25, verses one through 27. Before we begin though, let us have a word of prayer as we prepare our hearts and minds for our Bible study tonight. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you uh, so much for this Wednesday evening. We thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you, God, for watching over us as we slept last night. We thank you, God, for preserving us, God, through all of the things we've been through this week and this month and certainly this year. God, we give you praise and adoration for what you are doing in our lives. And certainly, Lord, we thank you for the chance uh, to come and to learn more of you through your printed word. Bless us tonight, O oh God, that we may open up our hearts and minds to hear your word. This, O oh Lord, is our prayer in your son, Jesus the Christ's name. Amen. All right. I uh, want to turn our attention to, again, the book of Acts, chapter number 25, verses 1 through 27. Acts 25, uh, verses 1 through 27. And I want to invite you to read along uh, with me. Uh, as we look at this particular chapter in the book of Acts. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, and I invite you to read along with me uh, with, whatever, with whatever version that you may have. Acts chapter 25, uh, verses 1 through 27. Let us now hear the word of the Lord. Three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where well, the chief priests and the leaders of the Jews gave him a report against Paul. They appealed to him and requested as a favor to them against Paul to have him transferred to Jerusalem. They were in fact planning an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So he said, let those of you who have the authority come down with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man, let them accuse him. After he had stayed among them not more than eight days, eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea. The next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he arrived, the Jews who had gone down from Jerusalem surrounded him, bringing many serious charges against him, which they could not prove. Paul said in his defense, I have in no way committed an offense against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against the emperor. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, asked Paul, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and be tried there before me on these charges? Paul said, I am appealing to the emperor's tribunal. This is where I should be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you very well know. Now, if I am in the wrong and have committed something for which I deserve to die, I am not trying to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can turn me over to them. I appeal to the emperor. Then Festus, after he had conferred with his counsel, replied, You have appealed to the emperor. To the emperor you will go. After several days had passed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to welcome Festus. Since they were staying there several days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man here who was left in prison by Felix. When I was in Jerusalem, the chief priest and the elders of the Jews informed me about him and asked for a sentence against him. I told them that it was not the custom of the Romans to hand over anyone before the accused had met the accusers face to face and had been given an opportunity to make a defense against the charge. 
So when they met here, I lost no time, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. When the accusers stood up, they did not charge him with any of the crimes that I was expecting. Instead, they had certain points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Since I was at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wished to go to Jerusalem and be tried there on these charges. But when Paul had appealed to me to be kept in custody for the decision of his imperial majesty, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to the emperor. Agrippa, said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you will hear him. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp, and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. Then Festus gave the order, and Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish community petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer, but I found that he had, not, had done nothing deserving death, and when he appealed to his imperial majesty, I decided to send him. But I have nothing definite to write our sovereign about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner without indicating the charges against him. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy word. Let us prepare our hearts and minds uh, for our scripture uh, deep dive tonight as we go into Acts chapter number 25, verses 1 through 27. All right, let us do a brief uh, recap of where we have been so far in our Bible study of the book of Acts. Again, a brief recap of that. As you know, when we started the book of Acts chapter number one, we were looking at the disciples and what they were uh, charged to do once Jesus had ascended to heaven. And one thing they were charged to do was to uh, form the church or to start the church. And so on that first Pentecost uh, day, Sunday rather, Peter preached and the Bible says that many thousands of people joined God's church primarily because they heard this good news of Jesus Christ in their very own ears. Now, why is this interesting? It is interesting because these were persons who were living physically in some other part of the world and had been living there for quite some time and spoke a different language from Peter. But on this day, because the Holy Spirit was moving, they were able to hear the good news of Jesus Christ and his salvation in their own hearing. When this occurred, of course, uh, the religious leaders of the city were not pleased because Jesus had been crucified. And here was Peter talking about the fact that Jesus was alive. And so what we find is in this particular next step, Peter and John are walking along one day and see a man who had been uh, unable to walk for quite some time, and he was leaning against the gate of the city. And as he was leaning there, uh, he appealed to Peter and to John to give him some, some money that he may be able to feed himself and, and take care of himself. And Peter and John said to him, silver and gold we don't have, but what we do have is the salvation of Jesus. And we would hope that this salvation would heal your body. Well, at this instance, his legs began to heal and he began to stand up and began to walk. Well, of course, when the people who knew him saw this, they also began to believe in the power of the name of Jesus. The Bible goes on to say that as Peter was walking along, uh, the spirit of the Lord was so powerful with him the very next day and the days to follow that when his shadow was cast on the ground, anybody upon whose, uh, upon whose shadow it fell was instantly healed. So, of course, when people saw this, uh, they really believed in the power of the name of Jesus because they realized that Peter was walking in the power of a God that could heal. Well, this, of course, upset uh, the religious leaders even more. They put Peter into jail, but in one instance, the Holy Spirit showed up and said to Peter, I'm going to free you 
from this prison so you can then go and preach the name of Jesus even more. And of course, Peter was freed and began to preach even more. Well, as the church grew and grew and grew and the message of Jesus began to, began to spread even more, uh, the people under uh, the charge of the disciples began to become very large. This was the cause of concern because there was a call for feeding of the widows and of the orphans, and Peter and the disciples were so uh, occupied with the work of building the church and spreading the message and attending to the spiritual work of the people that they, on one instance, were not able to provide the uh, ration of food to the widows and orphans. Uh, the widows complained about this, and because of this, Peter and the disciples realized they were missing out on a very important component of their ministry, and that was namely taking care of those who were indeed physically less fortunate than they were. This led them to uh, appeal to the Holy Spirit for direction. The Holy Spirit gave them direction and, and, and gave them an understanding to establish a new order of ministry called deacons, coming from the Greek word diakonos, which means to be a waiter or to wait on a table. And this particular brand of ministry was designed to specifically meet those needs of the widows and orphans so that Peter and the disciples could continue to devote themselves to the more spiritual and weighty matters. Well, there was one deacon who was the first deacon. Actually, his name was Stephen. The Spirit of God in him was so powerful that uh, in addition to uh, being a, a second uh, hand to the disciples, he also began to preach God's word. And on one instance, unfortunately, uh, the religious leaders of the city caught him and began to stone him to death. The Bible says that as he was being stoned to death, there was one particular man named Saul of Tarsus who was holding the coats of the men who were stoning him. In essence, he was encouraging them to go ahead and do this uh, harmful and hurtful thing. Uh, we bring up Saul's name in that instance because as he left from that place and was headed to a place called Damascus to get permission from the religious leaders in that city to do more persecuting of Christians, the Bible says that a bright light from heaven shined upon him, knocked him off of his horse, and as he was knocked down, uh, a voice from heaven said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul's response was, who are you? Uh, and the Bible says that the voice was that of Jesus, and he said, I am Jesus, the one whom you are persecuting. This experience was so much of a change for Paul. It was such a dramatic situation. It changed his life, and he began to believe in the very thing he was persecuting. Well, we oftentimes say that someone has a Damascus Road experience, and that's just where this comes from, because at that moment in your life, you may have experienced something so dramatic that it turns you away from what you are going to do and sets you on a new course. And so Paul then, who was formerly Saul, began to spread the good news of Jesus Christ to Gentiles after he had had several years of study with the disciples. Well, Peter, around the same time, was having a vision about spreading the good news to the Gentiles who had not formally heard the good news because no one had taken it to them. And he met a man named Cornelius who uh, was expecting him to come. And when Cornelius and his family heard the good news, uh, they believed in Jesus and became the first Gentile family to accept the Lord Jesus into their family. So we know that Saul, now Paul, went spreading the good news a lot of places. And in some places, he was convincing folks so quickly to leave their old worshiping habits that they also stopped buying the actual idols that were made for worship. This upset the mercantile exchange and upset those who were making money off of the idols being sold. And they conspired with the religious leaders of that city, wherever Paul went, to accuse him of things that they knew would get him put in jail. And that's where we find ourselves in Acts chapter number 25, where Paul has been sent from tribunal to tribunal and now in front of Festus, because you recall in the previous chapter, a man named Felix was supposed to set Paul free, but he was hoping to get some money from Paul to set himself free, and he didn't give him any money, so he left him there until Festus found him, all right? So now we are in Acts chapter number 25, and we are here with Paul uh, in front of Festus, and we got our first question here for us to dive into tonight. Why didn't Paul want his trial in Jerusalem? Why didn't Paul want his trial in 
Jerusalem. The Bible says uh, that Paul was uh, being brought in front of Festus and that there were some people who wanted him to be taken back to Jerusalem. But Paul didn't want to go back to Jerusalem. Let's look at verse number 11 and see what we can do- discover from there. Uh, Festus said, wishing to do the Jews a favor, asked Paul, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and be tried there before me on these charges? Paul said, I am appealing to the emperor's tribunal. This is where I should be tried. I have done nothing wrong to the Jews, as you very well know. Verse 11. Now, if I am in the wrong and, and have committed something for which I deserve to die, I am not trying to escape death, but if there is nothing to their charge against me, no one can turn me over to them. I appeal to the emperor. Paul is making a very simple appeal, simply saying, why should I go to Jerusalem to be tried when they don't have any charges against me? Now, if they do have charges, I am not trying to escape my punishment, but I know that I didn't do anything. If you recall a few chapters back, when Paul was before another person, he said to this man, I want to have a clear conscience between, before God and men, so let me tell you why they are mad at me. And so Paul wanted to be very clear about what he knew the truth to be. And so Paul is saying to Festus, there's no sense in taking me to Jerusalem to be tried in front of you in the town where my accusers have more power and I haven't done anything wrong. Paul simply says, if I've done something wrong, why don't we sell it right here? And what Paul does is Paul gives us a template, really, for how we can settle disagreements, how we can settle disputes, and how we can remove, remove confusion. If you and I ever find ourselves in a position where someone has uh, presented one side of the story and we know another side of the story, and we need someone to mediate between the two of us, the best thing we can do is gather all parties right there and have the evidence presented. And that's what Paul is saying. He said, listen, why waste time on traveling back to Jerusalem? I'm here, you are here, and they are here. Ask them what I did that was illegal. But what also is important is this. Paul is essentially saying, Here, as a Roman citizen, I am exercising my right to have the emperor hear my case, but more than that, I'm exercising my right as a Roman citizen to say, what Roman law have I broken? What have I done wrong? And so Paul, again, gives us a template for how we can settle disputes and how we can alleviate and eliminate confusion Oftentimes, confusion arises because there's not been an extra question asked. What happened? How did it happen? When did it happen? Oftentimes, people will run with conjecture. People will run with, I heard. They said. And the question often has to be asked is, what did they say? And what evidence is there that what they have said is true? Now, of course, in life, we cannot always reason, uh, as Bishop Leith has said, we can't reason with unreasonable people, right? And so many times you may find yourself in a position where people are unreasonable. That's where you have to also seek the Holy Spirit's guidance and appeal to someone who is reasonable. And so what Paul is saying is this, I know that if I go to Jerusalem, this case is going to get out of hand and I won't receive a fair trial because they've already levied lies against me. And the only way I escaped, right, was that I knew about their plan. The other reason that Paul did not want to go is because Paul knew that they planned on killing him on the way to Jerusalem. And so we praise God for when the Holy Spirit gives us a warning. The Holy Spirit is able to let us know when trouble is about, The Holy Spirit is able to let us know when danger is ahead. And sometimes we refer to it as as, as our conscience kicking in or a feeling we have. Well, that's the Holy Spirit trying to warn us of something. And so I would encourage you 
to open yourself up to hear more from God's Holy Spirit. God is always speaking, but we have to tune our ears and our spirit to hear his voice. All right. Second question. Uh, what did Festus discover about the accusations against Paul? What did Festus discover about the accusations against Paul? Verse number 19 gives us an indication of that. Verse 19 says, let me go, let me go to verse 18. When the accusers stood up, they did not charge him with any of the crimes that I was expecting. Instead, they had certain points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. See, now Festus has gotten to the root of the situation. And that's why sometimes, let me give you another uh, uh, tip here. Um, when we find ourselves in disagreement about what someone else has said, it's always good to sometimes, well, it's always good, rather, uh, well, I'll say sometimes, it's sometimes good to bring in a third party, an unbiased party, to hear both sides of the situation. That way they can give ear to both sides of the situation. Here is Festus discovering the truth of the matter, which is they don't have a charge against Paul. They don't agree with his particular take on the life of Jesus. And for that, they want to kill him. And so let me also give you direction on this, that when we find ourselves doing the work of God, there may be others who don't agree with our faith stance. We have to be rooted and grounded up in God's truth to know what we believe. That's why I think it is so important for us to, every Sunday, repeat the Apostles' Creed, to know what we believe to be firm in our own belief. Paul was convinced of what he knew of Jesus. He had seen and heard from the risen Savior. So that conviction led him to say, I know what I believe, and I also know that what they're accusing me of, I did not do. And notice also that at the right moment, God fought the battle for Paul. That's what I want you to understand also tonight. In your life, you don't have to fight every battle. God will fight your battles for you. And God was fighting Paul's battle. God revealed to Festus what Paul could not show him, which was Paul's accusers did not have any substantial charges against Paul. All they had was disagreements about their own religion. Final question. What was the delay in Festus sending Paul away to have a trial? What was the delay in Festus sending Paul away to have a trial? Verse 25 says this, But I had found that he had done nothing deserving death, and when he appealed to his imperial majesty, I decided to send him. This is Festus talking to uh, King Agrippa. And what he's saying to him is this. I'm not going to send him away because I really don't have any charges. Notice what verse 26 says. But I have nothing definite to write to our sovereign about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner without indicating the charges against him. Wow. So Festus has discovered that there are no legal charges against Paul. He talked to Paul himself, told King Agrippa, I don't have anything to charge him with. And so I can't send him to the emperor to appeal a charge when I don't have a charge to put on him. So maybe, King, you can, you can talk to him, and maybe you'll discover something, and maybe that'll be what we use to charge him with. Isn't it amazing that when you do the right thing, 
and when you are like Paul and have a clear conscience before God and men, that even your enemies will stumble in trying to defeat you. God's word said that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. The Bible never says that weapons won't be formed. It doesn't even say that weapons won't be fired. What it does say, though, is that those weapons will not prosper against us. So when you see weapons being formed, when you see people lining up to do you harm, when you see words being uttered to bring you down, when you see schemes being put together to harm you and what you're trying to do for God's kingdom, as long as you are clear in your faith in God, as long as you are convinced in your mission, and as long as you are convicted in your commitment to God, you can have a clear conscience before God and men, and you can rest assured that every attempt of the enemy to do you harm will be of no success. And so I want you to walk in that truth tonight and tomorrow. I want you to walk in that truth and in that power that God will indeed fight your battles, that God will go before your enemies. That's why David said, he will prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. God prepared a table for Paul in the presence of his enemies. Those who brought charges had no charges that were of any substance. The plot they had to kill him was of no success. Felix tried to get him to bribe him. That was of no success. Festus looked for charges, couldn't find any. And Agrippa had nothing to say also. All these attempts to muddy up the reputation of Paul and God kept fighting for him. Well, I hope that you've learned something more about the human condition, something more about the particular text that we are reading, or something more about the character of God during our Bible study tonight. Let me encourage you to join us for our prayer call tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Join us for Sunday school on Saturday. Uh, let us also keep the Winrow family in our prayers. As again, uh, by email, you should have received the, the uh, plans for uh, Sister Winrow's mother's uh, celebration of life on Saturday and the viewing, the drive-by viewing on Friday. Uh, let us keep them in our prayers. Uh, let us continue to pray for our 